All right, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so my talk today is, I think, the only talk in today's schedule um, not focusing specifically on transformers. Um, so the talk is titled Slot Attention Towards Object-Centric Perception. Um, you see the title has the word attention in there, and ultimately the kind of biases in architectures um, I've been looking at um, in, in the team I'm working with at Brain here in Amsterdam and with colleagues also in Berlin and, and Mountain View is um, effectively on architectures that look quite similar to transformers but have like some slight changes in terms of inductive biases that allow you to kind of discover objects in perceptual data and reason kind of in an object-centric way. And um, so this is kind of from a subfield within the community that's called object-centric learning. And the goal of object-centric learning is really to um, perceive and model the world around you using composable abstractions. And by composable abstractions, I mean um, abstractions that are learned directly from raw data in some kind of context or task-dependent manner. So let's say you look at the world around you and um, you have things like a traffic scene or you see these animals here uh, marching on the street or you have this kind of Newton's cradle set up here. Um, ultimately, the way you perceive these scenes is really in terms of like the, the things that pop out really into existence as soon as you look at this are like the objects and the entities in there and you can kind of mentally simulate what's going to happen next and how and especially how kind of each individual entity or object is going to interact in this environment and um, so the reason why we we are interested in object-centric learning is well because humans seem to be doing something very similar and ultimately we care about like interfacing machine learning models with humans so um, objects are kind of a very core problem to to be addressed and and also like if we if we manage to kind of have objects emerge in those representations like we do as, as humans when we learn about the world um, we get a lot of label data efficiency like we to, to, to understand the world we don't need like a big label data set of like hand like hand annotated uh, individual object instances of bounding boxes around them and segmentation masks um, and so there's a lot to be gained from 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 kind of um, having emergent representations that that are structured in terms of objects, and at the same time, if we if we abstract away into objects, we get things like compositional generalization, um, in part for free. Um, so we don't need to um, explicitly worry about these kinds of problems. Now, ideally, these kinds of models shouldn't be explicitly supervised. Um, we know, at least in, in humans, that these kinds of representations can emerge without supervision or direct supervision. Um, they can also emerge in the absence of language. Um, so we, we focus a lot on like language and multimodal perception these days, but a lot of the things we understand ab about the world, we understand also without language, uh, and especially like if you look at the animal kingdom. And um, also like abstractions and objects are not necessarily like clear cut. Like these are typically context and task dependent abstractions. So it's a, it's a more complex problem than just uh, having a data set of like individually annotated like um, objects because what what defines an object is very much context or task dependent. Now the, the kind of core architecture that has emerged in this kind of space is um, what, what some people call slot-based neural networks. And, and, and there you see, you're going to see already like the similarity to transformers. So effectively you have like, let's say some perceptual data like vision or audio. You have some kind of encoder and that encoder gives you, uh, let's say a grid representation um, of the encoded like image or audio data. And this could be a, a vision transformer, this could be a CNN or any kind of encoder you like. Now the interesting part is how do we move from um, this kind of low-level processing to some higher-level abstractions or, or grouping of inputs. And, and this is where um, the core element of these slot-based neural networks comes in. So we want to abstract away into a, a set of, of latent variables, so a set of tokens, a set of queries, uh, whichever you might call them. But the, the really important bit here is that you have like a set of those and they don't really have a specific meaning depending on like whether they're index number one or index number two. Um, so every one of those slots can really capture anything in the input. And that's what we mean with like object understanding us in humans. And um, ultimately, once you have this kind of composable abstraction, you can very easily kind of learn compositions of that, relations between them, and, and also model dynamics into the future. And you can train these kind of representations using some kind of downstream task or loss. Now, what I already hinted at, the, the kind of core design principle, the core inductive bias 
behind this kind of architecture is that we want uh, these slot representations to be symmetric under permutation. And so that really means that um, it doesn't matter if like a particular object in the input ends up in slot one or slot two or slot n, the model generalizes in exactly the same kind of way. And um, the, the, the kind of architecture that, that we've been working on in the last two or so years in this space um, is a, a simple attentional mechanism that, that performs exactly this kind of abstraction from lower level input features like, like images or encoded images to these higher level uh, abstract variables. And so this, this attention mechanism we call slot attention and effectively it's an iterative competitive attention mechanism um, that performs some kind of routing from these lower level perceptual features to these higher level um, abstract features. And this, this um, simple module you can then place, for example, into a um, object discovery architecture by, by simply putting it into an auto encoder. So you, you start with like uh, images on the one side, you encode it using some visual backbone, you put this uh, grouping or slot attention mechanism in there and they decode back into the image space. Um, and, and similarly, what we've already seen in, in uh, cases talk just earlier is you can also uh, address detection problems or set prediction problems like this, basically using an attention mechanism on top of a backbone where you then predict a set of, say, bounding boxes or any other kind of set-based representation. And slot attention can also do that in that kind of, um, in that kind of setup. So uh, just to reiterate what the core prediction problem is we're looking at, um, it's basically learning a mapping from an image or some other modality to a set of latent variables. And intuitively here, each, each set element should really be, um, be able to capture, say, an object, a part of an object, or even the entire background. So we don't really prescribe um, any particular meaning to these slots ahead of time. And um, that is also kind of the core difference from like an architecture you might have heard of from a couple of years ago that was pretty popular for some time, but, but really hasn't uh, like caught up to like transformers, et cetera, these days, which are capsule networks. And in capsule networks, you have effectively the same kind of pitch. Like you want to route information from lower level features into higher level capsules. The problem with capsule networks was basically that the uh, capsules were not symmetric under permutation, not exchangeable. So you had like one particular capsule uh, responsible for dogs, one particular capsule responsible for cars and so forth. And uh, what happened if you had two cars in the image? Well, you couldn't really address the problem. So people invented convolutional capsules and so forth. Um, but, but it turns out if you just um, impose permutation symmetry, all of, this, all of these problems go away. And so, um, Ultimately, what, what the um, slot attention module looks like in terms of code is, is relatively simple. And this is also the only technical slide I have in my talk today, where uh, we just look at like what, what the actual routing mechanism looks like. And so let's say you start with some inputs. These are kind of your encoded feature maps um, from your backbone. Um, and you add position embeddings on top. And uh, then you're interested in kind of what are the the, the slots you want to read out from those. And so initially we start by initializing the slots, for example, at random, um, or we can also use a learned uh, initialization for these slots. But then for a number of time steps, the operation we carry out is effectively uh, a simple attention mechanism um, where we first compute a, a dot product score between the um, key transformed inputs and the query transformed slots. So this at this point, just looks like a regular transformer kind of attention. And then we perform a typical softmax normalization after normalizing by some temperature. And uh, the core difference here now between, um, say, what, what one would do in regular cross attention as part of a transformer is that we normalize the, the scores over the output, over the queries or the slots in this case. So transformers, you would usually normalize over the keys or the values. And what this normalization over the output gives you is uh, a form of competition. So that basically, if one slot already explains one object in the input, the other slot has to pay a price for also explaining it. And so ultimately what the model converges on um, is uh, a separation of these kind of entities into individual, in, in individual slots. And lastly, we, we, we compute the updates using uh, a weighted mean of the of the value transformed inputs. Also very similar to transformers, the only difference here is that 
we use a weighted mean instead of a weighted sum because we, we now normalize the attention weights over a different axis. So if we would do a weighted sum, these scores could blow up. And so we need to renormalize. Lastly, uh, so we frame this as an iterative update. So we use some iterative uh, module like a gated recurrent unit, but you could also use skip connections here. And ultimately we use things like layer norm um, and, and skip connections in, in the entire architecture to make it scalable. So when you compare this to an algorithm that you might know, which is k-means or a soft version of it uh, called soft k-means, there are some striking similarities. So basically in soft k-means, um, you would again start from some initialized cluster centers. In this case, these would be the slots. Um, and for a number of iterations, you would compute some score. Uh, in this case, a simply Euclidean distance. And for um, these time steps, effectively what you compute, the weights are exactly the same as in the solid attention mechanism. So here again, for k-means, you normalize the attention coefficients effectively over the output. And um, then again, you perform a weighted mean. So the main difference between these two algorithms is that we place a lot of uh, learnable components in between, and we do not explicitly minimize the Euclidean distance. We, uh, we basically have the key value transform so that the model can learn to cluster or group under any kind of downstream task that we want to optimize. So basically the model has to group the input or route the information, the input to, to latent variables to optimize a certain downstream task. And what this buys us now is effectively if you just put this module into a simple autoencoder, and this is done here in this very simple kind of grayscale scenes um, with uh, some colorful objects in the back and uh, the foreground. Um, here we would again just put a, a visual backbone in front, then apply slot attention, and um, then decode each slot individually into um, back into the image space. And to make this work, we we uh, in addition to the um, colored channels, we also decode an alpha channel, and this allows us to effectively remix each individually decoded slot back into a single image. And so the only way we train this on now is basically we uh, use an L2 reconstruction loss. And what pops out um, after we train this model is um, the model effectively learns a decomposition of the scene into individual objects. And so we can inspect what the model learns by, by just um, reconstructing each of those slots individually and just seeing what information is now contained in the slot. And uh, what you see here is like the model uh, decomposes these scenes um, and it keeps slots empty if it doesn't need the slots for, for explaining the scene. And an interesting aspect is also if you now would, for example, um, remove the top right slot, like slot 11 with the blue uh, cube in there, um, the model would actually um, render the entire object in slot number 5. Like the sphere which is currently occluded, the model kind of has an internal um, amodally completed uh, version of the object in its internal representation but it doesn't render it here at this moment because the other object is in front of it. But once you remove it, the model would render the entire object that's behind it. And so you can see it, it kind of, without any supervision, just by a simple inductive bias of like permutation symmetry and, and competition, um, the model learns to like discover something that is very, very natural to us when we look at these images. And now the question is, how can, you, how can you scale this to more interesting problems? Like static images are, are nice and, and interesting, but ultimately we care about like modeling like the, the, the visual world and uh, like especially the dynamical visual world. Because our world is not static and also temporal dynamics tells us a lot about object structures. So you might have heard about Gestalt principles where things that move together are perceived as kind of grouped together. And a lot of these kinds of inductive biases that we have um, we also see kind of fall out just by these very simple inductive biases uh, implemented in these models. And then effectively what these models learn is like they learn to cluster things that, that move together just by the simple permutation invariant uh, bottleneck. And so ultimately these temporally consistent abstractions uh, can also serve as a basis for many downstream tasks. Like if you want to predict the future, um, if you want to say, perform some kind of visual reasoning tasks on top of it, can be very helpful to have an abstraction of a scene um, that really crisply identifies the individual objects. And so now if we apply the same model, but then with a, a simple kind of adapter in between that just takes the slots that are discovered at one time step and just 
uses them to initialize slot attention at the next time step, that's the only real change we do here. Then you can, um, for example, apply this model to, to these robotic dataset videos where then what you, what you see here is that, uh, so the original video is always on the left-hand side, and then you see the decomposition that the model learns uh, in the right-hand side. And so each individual color here indicates like a particular slot that is responsible for, for explaining that part of the input. And so ultimately, you see that the model like discovers all the objects. It um, kind of decomposes its gripper arm into like the two independently moving parts, and it cleanly kind of segments also the background out of it. This, now this is a very simple scene because we always have the same colored objects and the same uh, gripper arm, so it's kind of relatively unambiguous what the objects are. But uh, if you want to scale this to more complex data, we need to we need to solve these problems. Um, just one more point I want to mention is if you now, now here we show um, a reconstruction where you, we, where you then visualize the individual reconstructed slots, which is something I haven't shown in the previous example. Um, but this is something you can always get for free out of these models. Like you can just visualize what each slot learns and then you have a crisp uh, decomposed representation of that object. And in this case, even including the shadow that belongs to the object. Um, now, if you want to control uh, what the model actually learns, you can put uh, segmentation uh, you can initialize a model, for example, using segmentation mass or bounding box and can control what information ends up in which slot. And, and that way we can steer the model in terms of decomposition. Now we recently scaled this model to more complex driving scenes um, by basically just scaling the backbone. So the model we call SAVI or slot attention for video. And we, we supervise this using uh, LIDAR or self-supervision using a depth signal. And um, what you can see in this architecture is we basically have the same setup as before. We have an encoder, we have these slots that are recurrent over time. We decode them into a, now a LiDAR-based depth signal and segmentation masks emerge just from the model itself. And now if you train this model on, on these driving scenes, you see that objects start to emerge uh, without any direct supervision. In this case, we condition a model on bounding boxes in the first frame so it knows what to track because there's a lot of ambiguity here. But we can also run this in a fully unsupervised setting without any conditioning. And then individual kind of slots tend to capture also environmental objects like uh, street lanterns and so forth. Now, um, before I conclude, I want to briefly mention uh, just one more, one more work in how we can use a simple inductive bias, not on videos, but now in 3D scenes to learn about um, appearance of objects from various kind of angles and their geometric representations. So in this work, we um, instead of like auto encoding individual views or auto encoding videos, what we do is we um, perform novel view synthesis. So you get a few uh, a number of reference frames from particular camera uh, camera angles, and you now want to render the scene from novel viewpoints. So the model effectively has from a single image or from multiple image has to predict what the scene would look like if looked at from a different angle. And again, we can just put a simple slot attention bottleneck in there and, and object segmentations and object representations fall out of this model. And uh, the architecture here is effectively a big transformer. So the encoder is a transformer encoder, the decoder is some kind of transformer encoder, and, and the only change we really make here is put a slot attention bottleneck in there. Now to conclude, um, these kinds of um, methods on self-supervised object-centric learning have really started to take off in the last couple of years, and they kind of present a new approach to uh, doing computer vision or perception. Um, whereas in the past we, we relied on kind of large labeled data sets, especially a lot of human annotated uh, bounding boxes and segmentation masks for objects, we can now start to see that these kinds of things can actually emerge with just very simple inductive biases in these architectures. Now, real-world results are still in their infancy, but our hope is that at scale, this will likely be useful for interactive scene editing, um, for problems like causal and physical modeling, um, but also for things like visual reasoning and robotic manipulation. And you can see a little example here of scene editing with this 3D scene rec uh, representation model here, where we just iterate over the individual slots that the model learns and just remove them one at a time. And it's not perfect and the reconstructions are pretty blurry, but you see that um, there's some compositionality that comes out of this model. And with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators and I think we have a few minutes for questions. All right, thank you very much. You have questions?
Thanks. Great talk and uh, great inductive bias as well. Very nice segue from, from Case's talk, I think. Uh, I have a really dumb question. Could you say something about the effect of the number of slots? Because for these, these sort of scene manipulation and, and all these objects in the scene, of course, the number of slots is quite obvious. You want as many as there are objects. So how does this work for, for example, some of this real world data? And how do you pick it? That's a really great question. So basically, um, it, it gives you the capacity the model has to represent the scene. And what we effectively see, if you don't give enough slots, the model just um, puts things together into a single slot. And that's usually not a problem if you give it enough capacity. Um, at some point, like the typical things you care about in a scene or in some local crop of a scene or a video is usually on the order of like tens of things, usually not a hundred, hundreds of things. And so if you give it like, 30, 40, 50 slots or so. Um, like in this scene transformer example, we gave it like 32 slots. And um, that usually is fine and the model learns to keep the ones it doesn't need empty. But it's a great question. And I think uh, still requires a lot of kind of investigation to figure out the, the perfect number of slots. It's probably going to be 42 or something like that. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you for the talk. So I assume the slots are more abstract than the input, but when they are being trained, they're being trained for reconstruction. So where does the information come for perfect reconstruction, given the slots are abstract to begin with? That's a great question. Um, so basically, there is some compression going on because we, uh, we, we, we take the scene and we put it into a scene representation that has like a number of like latent variables. But we can make those latent variables really big. Um, like in the scene representation transformer examples, these were really big vectors. And uh, we don't necessarily need a bottleneck here. So we don't, we don't need to make these small to get like a, uh, an explicit compression. Uh, we just need to make the set small. Um, and if you make the set small, but like, we can make the vectors really big, um, this seems to be enough for, for this kind of decomposition to emerge. Um, it's less so in autoencoding because there's a lot of failure modes. The model can just cheat eventually. Um, but if it has to do some interesting tasks like predict what the scene looks like from a novel viewpoint, um, then all these cheating failure modes go away. And then uh, usually you don't need an explicit bottleneck anymore. Yeah, I see another question in the back. Thank you for the great talk. And uh, I wanted to ask, uh, assuming that you don't know how to pick the right number of slots, uh, would there be a way to uh, query the model to choose uh, what you want to pay attention on? Like, let's say you only care about pedestrians, regardless of the training data and so on. And you would like to say that at inference time. That's a really great question. And so um, what I already hinted to at like, the very beginning of the talk, so we want these kind of abstractions to be context dependent or query dependent. And like the ideal way would be to be able to interact like with um, language, for example, or to be able to interact with like a point and click interface and just like tell the model like what to focus on or what kind of task you want to solve. And um, like the, the, the short answer is we're not there yet. So it, it's, it's like an open research question of like how do you actually kind of condition these models? Um, you, you probably need to embed this in a, in a wider set of tasks. Uh, that would be my guess, and, and have like a rich kind of experience of like queries and interaction with an environment to be able to, to really learn context-dependent abstractions. So uh, maybe I will wrap it up. Yeah, I Hello? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can set offline. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe I can uh, wrap it up with one question myself. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so my impression is that a lot of this kind of um, work like, like you've done that have some kind of uh, discrete um, discrete bottleneck on the representation capacity and, and these kind of things are not that popular because they shine in benchmarks that are not that popular or say like they're not that good on ImageNet or like what people kind of like the numbers that people look at. So if you if you can dream of like a future in where like computer vision benchmarking culture in general kind of shifts away from ImageNet or like um, that. How, how does that look like? How do you hope that computer vision benchmarking, um, what, what people will care about in five years times when, when they publish papers about computer vision, basically? So I think we already see like, just for instance centric tasks, like um, panoptic segmentation is an interesting one uh, where basically these kinds of models already uh, form the state of the art. Like you see things like K-means mass transformer, a recent paper from Google Research, 
that has a very similar bottleneck. It basically does like soft k-means kind of style routing. And there, these in inductive biases are really helpful if like the, the problem aligns with it. I think ultimately we probably need to go to much more generic tasks like robotics downstream tasks, something like that. But also just things like scene editing is an interesting problem where supervision is going to be very hard to uh, like, like you, you need to, if you want to perfect scene editing and interacting with a scene, you need to understand the physics of the world effectively um, to be able to see if like what happens if you remove the glass and there's a water in there, um, then the water has to flow out, etc. So you, you kind of really have to fully understand uh, the world. And I think moving to those kinds of tasks will um, make those kinds of compositional models shine much more in the future, I think.